Tonight on Top Gear, choosing from three desirable executive saloons. The confusion at the pumps over super unleaded petrol. And a not so humble Ford Sierra with 500 horsepower to play with. Hello and welcome to this week's Top Gear. Back from Frankfurt, we're now on our motorway bridge on the M1, just a few miles north of London. At the moment, the traffic is moving fairly freely, but our motorways are some of the most congested in Europe. Whatever happens in terms of new roads, we're always going to have, of course, those horrendous starlaps that you can get trapped in seemingly for hours. And that's really why we're here. Look at the latest attempt to build a better motorway jam warning system based on infrared sensors on the bridges. But more of that later. Let's start not with the jams themselves, but with the smooth cars that some executives have the privilege of sitting in when they're trapped in one. And with the advent of the European spirit and the less obvious need to buy British, Chris Goff has been looking at three European offerings. Now, which niche of the executive market does the Alpha 164 Lusso Automatic drop into? Well, it's for those with a generous budget at their disposal and a fleet manager who isn't too worried by the prospect of steep depreciation. Perhaps Saab have attracted more executives to their models, but there can't be many middle management transport budgets which will stretch to accommodate this CD version. Maybe it's moved above the market it was originally aimed at. A substantially cheaper choice would be the equivalent model from Lancia's Thema range, but not enough user-choosers exercise their privilege to keep the Lancia importer independent. It's now firmly back under Fiat's wing. Now, the thing that unites all these cars is money, not what it costs to buy them in the showroom, but what it costs to develop them, because all three cars, plus incidentally the Fiat Chroma, share the same floor pan. The manufacturers got together and they pooled their resources to come up with a new executive car. They'd all put different bodies on and different engines, but they'd share the same floor pan and that would save them a lot of money in coming out with a new model. Now this is the latest product of that cooperation. It's the automatic version of the Alpha 164. And it's a very important car for the British market because Alfa Romeo have significantly failed in the past to crack the executive fleet sector. If they can't do it with this car, they won't do it at all. And they hope to avenge with this model some of the disappointments of the past. This is a booted version of the familiar Saab 9000 hatchback and in this form it's a, a very highly specified and extremely expensive vehicle. It's £28,000 on the road. £1,500 of that is taken up with a, a very sophisticated sound system that incorporates a CD player. Incidentally, it also occupies the space that would be taken up by the ashtray and cigar lighter. And there's a little discreet sign saying no smoking. That won't impress some executives I know. This is very much the flagship of the Lancia range. I've always called it the Thema, but I'm reliably informed I ought to call it the Thema. In SE form, it's very well equipped up to the specification of the other two and certainly very good value on the road. The only thing you can't get is an automatic gearbox with the turbo. But like the other two cars, it's got a, a six-year anti-corrosion warranty. Now, while all these cars share the same floor pan and they've all got front wheel drive, the designers have got very different ideas when it comes to power plants. The fuel injected V6 in the Alpha is the most charismatic and the best looking unit. There's a broad band of tremendous power and torque and it mates well with the automatic. Saab's 2 litre 16 valve unit goes down the turbo road but it's a poor match with its automatic. It seems to smother the power and hunts up and down when cruising. At Lancia's heart is another 16-valve 2-litre, but it's got a smaller, higher revving turbo, which gives a wider spread of power. The differences continue when it comes to luggage capacity. The Alpha suffers from a high sill and rather a narrow slot for inserting anything more than the standard Italian briefcase. The Saab's better with the boot lid lifting well up out of the way, but like the others, it stores its spare wheel under the floor. Saab alone fit a narrow space saver wheel, but at least that helps give it a much greater boot capacity. The Tamer, for instance, has 18.9 cubic feet, one more than the Alpha, but five cubic feet less than the Saab. 
The Alfa Romeo betrays the influence of the stylist on the interior much more than the other two. All the minor instruments and controls come together beautifully. It's also fitted with, uh, in the Lusso model, electric rear passenger seats, although I, I note on this 7,000 mile example, one of them already doesn't work. And it also means that the seats can't fold down for extra rear luggage space. Scandinavian design has tended in the past to be rather austere and spartan, but the interior of this Saab with its supple Scottish leather and its English walnut reminds you more of a, a Victorian gentleman's smoking club than anything. Despite that, it's the most comfortable of the three cars. Inside the Lancia, very Italian in feel, they trim it in Alcantara, a cloth that looks and feels very much like suede. There's lots of room for oddment storage in this car as well, in the door pockets down here, and it's also got the only glove box with space to rest your glasses of executive wine. So the cars are very different under the skin, but what are they like on the road? Let's find out. I've always loved the Alpha V6 unit. It's got a a lovely exhaust snarl to it and despite the automatic gearbox it hasn't lost that appeal. The handling, well that's flat and uh, secure, big fat tyres, very high level of adhesion on the road. It's not all sweetness and light though, it's got a, an over large turning circle this car and I find these uniform switches on the panel rather confusing once you're on the move. On the road in the Saab, you're immediately aware that there is still some turbo lag. The classic situation, you come up behind a lorry, you pull out to overtake, put your foot flat on the floor, and there's a, a heart-stopping instant when it doesn't actually go. And then the turbo comes in and you accelerate through. On its big, fat tyres, it's got extremely high levels of road holding and adhesion. In fact, it's the, the ultimate gentleman's express. In the Lancia, you're immediately aware of the tremendous power and torque from the turbocharged engine. There's less turbo lag than there was in the Saab, but because it's got a manual gearbox and there isn't the cushioning effect of the automatic, it's quite easy to get quite violent wheel spin when pulling away from a T-junction, especially on a, a wet road. But apart from that, the uh, handling and the tyre adhesion is very high order indeed, certainly well up to the other two cars. It's very, very fast. I mean, it does 140 miles an hour, but if you want to go completely over the top, you can even double your money and buy a Ferrari engine version. So which car to go for? Well, in fact, it's quite a difficult choice for the lucky executive because all three cars have such distinct personalities. The Alpha is undoubtedly the best looking and the best style, but I resent this loss of an inch of headroom that Pininfarina has imposed in order to get those flowing lines. The Saab, well, it's very safe and secure, it feels very well built. And the Lancia, with its immensely powerful engine, represents tremendous appeal for the driver. Which one would I go for? Well, if my company would allow the extra £6,000 on the budget, I'd have to select the Saab. Right, back from those smooth saloons to the motorway jam warning system, we've come into a field, as you can see, to get away from all that motorway noise. Those infrared sensors on the bridge can detect the speed at which the cars are moving. They pass that information to a central control room, which in turn flashes it to a network of paging stations. In the car, what you've got is a little graphic receiver. In this case, it's fixed. They now have a, a portable version you can take anywhere. It's got a map of the relevant motorway network, and you drive along with that in standby mode. When the sensors detect that the traffic is slowing down, say 20 or 10 miles an hour, or they've come to a dead halt, the thing buzzes you to attract your attention, then shows you where the problem is occurring. So you can press on if you think it'll clear up or begin to take avoiding action. That's how it works in theory. Let's give it a whirl in practice. Well, I'm heading north on the M11, ready to turn west on the M25 towards Heathrow. I've got the system on standby. Everything seems clear at the moment. Oh no, there goes an alarm. There is trouble, in fact, up ahead on the M11, but it's north of my junction, so I should be okay. You can see the traffic slowed down to about 20 miles an hour. And one of the real advantages of this system is it does give real-time information. You can see what's happening to the traffic as it's happening. It costs about uh, £30 a month to rent, about £270 to buy all in. So not expensive for the executive who wants to miss those traffic jams. Oh, there goes another alarm. Oh, the system's getting worse. It's now backed up inside the M25. 
I'm going to have to leave uh, the M11 before I get to my junction. Clearly the system works. Uh, it's available from next spring for all the M25 area. All I would say is it hasn't been through the mill of millions of miles of uh, motorway motoring, but certainly a system worth keeping an eye on. Right, here comes my escape route. Well, time for drop of petrol, unleaded of course. Now this time last year, the sales of unleaded were only about 1% of the total, although there was a lot of interest. We had over 7,000 requests for these information leaflets when we did an item last October. Since then, sales have soared to 25%, but there they seem to have leveled off, much to the dismay of the oil companies who've really geared themselves up. Now the problem seems to be confusion rather than unwillingness, because a recent survey by the RSC showed that six out of ten motorists still weren't sure whether their car could use unleaded or not. Ironically, the situation hasn't been helped by the introduction of high-octane unleaded petrol. BP was first with the introduction of Super Green, as we showed last spring. So Tom Bosler has been taking another look at the mysteries of going green. Once upon a time, there used to be two-star, three-star and four-star petrol, varying octane ratings for varying power output. Three Star dropped out, and in the last year, Two Star has been largely replaced by Unleaded. Now, Unleaded is not equivalent to Four Star, so to switch to it, some cars need their timing adjusted, and that might have meant a loss of power and fuel economy. But have motorists noticed the difference? Um, there's no difference in the performance. I think so at the start. It seemed a bit sluggish, but since then, I've not noticed. Better for the environment. I think so, it's better for the car, it's better for the environment. It's probably better for everybody, isn't it? On some cars, switching to unleaded petrol is not just a simple matter of one or two adjustments. The lead in the fuel also acts as a lubricant for the valves and seats. On this MGB head, for instance, the valve seats have to be machined out and replaced with some specially hardened inserts. And unless that is done, the wear on the head will be about three times more than normal. Now, one solution could be to every so often put in a tank full of leaded petrol, but of course that still pollutes the atmosphere. A much better solution would be to use one of these non-toxic, lead-free additives. This shouldn't really be necessary because the, the technology of getting valve lubrication without lead is well known. Uh, additives should be added uh, at the refinery, uh, as is now being done in Europe and the United States. If motorists in Britain could buy unleaded petrol with those sort of additives now, then a lot of confusion would be saved and maybe a lot of money. I, for one, would have been saved over £200 having the head on this engine and the timing modified. But some cars, like most Jaguars for instance, can't be adjusted to take 95 octane unleaded fuel. They need a full 98 octane. Oil companies know how to make high-octane unleaded petrol, incorporating valve lubricants that would be suitable for all cars now on the road without any adjustment. They would run more economically and clean, more cleanly for the environment. In fact, Amoco have been selling a full range of unleaded petrols in the USA for 60 years, until recently using the slogan, the only one certified lead-free. So why haven't the oil companies done it here? And why didn't they sell the high-octane, super-unleaded to start with, anyway? With a 10p tax advantage, it still sells for two pence less than the four-star leaded. The costs of making high-octane, unleaded petrol have been grossly exaggerated. At the most, three p a gallon, probably uh, much less than that. And the motorist would save at least that amount, as shown by studies in the United States, because of reduced uh, motoring costs. We put some of these points to the oil companies, First of all, has there been an exaggeration in the production costs of unleaded fuel? Mobile told us. It's down to market prices, really. There's no exaggeration in prices at the pumps. The price of oil is determined by the international market and not by the individual oil companies. So why didn't we go straight to super unleaded? BP told us it wasn't our decision. The government laid down the standards for the existing unleaded fuel and there isn't even now a standard for super unleaded. But what about a substitute for lead as a lubricant? Esso told us, if we could find an additive that would suit all cars, then of course we would use it. What a market. We would do it. If it were that simple, we would have done it already. But Amoco still hadn't produced a high-octane unleaded fuel for Britain. 
Why? They say the market is already confused and the introduction of another grade of unleaded fuel would confuse it further. So where does that leave us, the ordinary motorist? Basically, there are just two categories. If your car has been modified, as has this particular Sierra, to take unleaded petrol, then you can use super unleaded any time you like. But you won't get the advantage of that extra octane level unless you have the car returned to the original settings. If, on the other hand, like with this particular Cavalier, your car has not been adjusted to take unleaded petrol, then, of course, you can still use super unleaded. The Cavalier doesn't require any additives, but your particular car may require a lead substitute. And if it does, you'll have to continue adding that substitute until such time as the oil companies put it in the petrol for you. Well, look, if the oil industry decided to get its act together, they could perfectly well manufacture a high-octane, unleaded petrol, with, with incorporating suitable valve lubricants, which would be suitable for all cars now on the road, without any adjustment. And what's more, they would run better, more cheaply, with reduced maintenance costs. And that means that we could then put a padlock on all the leaded pumps. They'd no longer be necessary. Quite obsolete. And if you're still in doubt, then you should ask your dealer about your particular car. Meanwhile, we'd like to hear from you about your experiences with or without unleaded petrol, why you haven't changed over, why you have, the effect it's had on your motoring. I'll give you the address later on. But now to less controversial matters, Jeremy Clarkson's been to a sale at the National Motor Museum at Bewley, which turned out to be light years away from a conventional classic car auction. In 23 years, Bewley Auto Jumble has grown from something very parochial and afternoon tea-ish into something absolutely vast. Predictably, only the Americans do it bigger, and they probably wear brighter clothes too. Over 45,000 people are going to come here this weekend. Traders, enthusiasts, junk hunters, eccentrics, and of course, the inevitable cowboys. It's reckoned that over three million pounds is going to change hands. An auto jumble is somewhere people come to buy and sell and swap anything to do with motoring. That means pretty well everything from a sunbeam track rod end to a fully restored Mark II Jaguar. This is a Jaguar that is restored in New Zealand. They're built to order. Um, it's about a six months delivery period. Um, and they're quite a lot cheaper than the English restored equivalent cars. But it's not only cars. It's amazing. Sometimes they turn up in a box, all in pieces, rusty, and they finish up like that beautiful Rover there. You see, that was rebuilt, and they are so... You can't believe it when you see how rusty they can be and how beautiful they finish. People are trying to sell vintage cars and veteran cars and cars that people hope one day will be classics, and what on earth is this? It's a marina. Explain. It's a near the car that's developed by like Morris Housen. In a couple of years, who knows, they may be the sought after as Morris Housen's. But you can drive one of these, get the same performance as an MGB, and have fun. But of course, most people are here for the bits. <laughs> With over 1,500 stalls here, it's nearly impossible to find anything specific, and particularly when they all look broadly like this. I mean, what on earth is this? And this, for instance, if you have an Austin 7, you'll probably recognise it as a piece of timing gear. If you don't, well, then it looks a bit like a piece of metal that belongs on a scrap heap. Know what I mean? It's just a question of rummaging rain and finding it, you know, that's the situation, really. It's off a maze. I bought it for an A10 combination. So it's just a ticket, which I want, really. It's good. I couldn't get it, you know, built for anything like that. You're going to make it yourself? Well, no, that is, that's it. I'm just going to bolt that straight into the front of my bike. Today's ideal. You can come right, come along and just rake round the um, boxes and find what you need. And slowly but surely, we're kitting out a full toolkit. I have a Frogger Pride and an MG8. And there's no way you could buy stuff for them in Germany. Oh yes, you can, but you find these things easier here. But do you have auto jumbles in Germany? Yes, we have. Big as this one? Not as big as this one, and uh, not as, and that the atmosphere is not as good as here. And you're after a Sprite seat. I know this because look. It seems to me that some of these prices are a result of dealers selling to each other. Trader A buys something from Trader B, even before the show is open, and the increased cost is passed on to Joe Public. 
Right, right business has been very good. We took uh, a fair amount before we opened the doors this morning. And let's hope it continues all day. Eight pound here? Never. Yes. Got 14 and 9 on there. Well, all right then. You give me the 14 and 9, you can have it. Ten shillings. He's only got the 14 and 9, hasn't he? Quit for that, <laughs> You're not having it. It's too late, mate. He's, He's already done it. A night, so, uh, you know, you can't argue, can right. you? Right. Ten shillings. Twelve and six. <laughs> <laughs> you never expected this, did you? <laughs> Thirteen and six. Three, three pence pieces is fourteen and nine pence. Thank you very much. Well, there you are, sir. Thank and you very much. Fits. That's very nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Ah, I know what this is. It's a tail lamp of a Mark I Cortina, which I suppose were all the rage when this Salto Jumble first started. I happen to have been the, uh, the first spectator to go through the gate uh, all, the, all that long time ago and uh, I think Lord Montague said, uh, come back, come back, and I said, well, sorry, too late, I'm off. Now, all I wanted was an Alfa Romeo windscreen wiper. Did I get one? No. But I'm not that bothered, because I picked this up. It's good, isn't it? And then there's a little something to get us both home. Well, over the past two years, when Grand Prix racing has seemed rather more like a McLaren benefit race than anything else, most of the excitement from televised motorsport has come from Grandstand's regular coverage of the SO British Touring Car Championship. All the fastest cars are Sierras, although they're a long way away, of course, from the conventional reps car, or indeed this rather more powerful 4x4 version. Tiffany Dell has been having a go. Tiffany Dell, ex Grand Prix driver, into the Sierra, out of the pit lane, into the race. And that was a really slick pit stop. Excellent work. And there's contact, there's a nudge, and off goes Van Kahn into the sand trap. But he's kept the Sierra rolling, and there is Tiffany Dell through in the lead. As Harvey comes out of the pits, Sofa takes Jones, and there's contact between Pinkney and Smith, and Sofa. Every man's dream, taking the chequered flag. But that win earlier this year was my only victory so far this season. And, unless you're Senna or Prost, winning doesn't come easily. But what is a Group A touring car? Well, you start with a model of which at least 5,000 cars have been built in one year. One such model is this, the Ford Sierra RS Cosworth. It's a pretty impressive car in its standard trim, but for Group A, you are allowed one or two minor modifications. Modifications began with this, an Evolution Special. The regulations permit a manufacturer to build 500 specials and incorporate those modifications on the racing car, hence the RS500 Cosworth. Now we have this larger rear wing, the whale tail, two-tier. In the engine, there's a larger turbocharger and larger intercooler, which allows the power to be raised from 200 horsepower to 225. The front spoiler now has a lower chin for aerodynamics and also more ducting to increase the airflow into the coolers. And so we come to the racing model itself. There's now slick racing tyres, racing brakes, and very firm racing suspension. In the engine bay, well, there's a lot of heat shielding. There's a lot of this aircraft specification, high pressure piping. There's a mechanical fuel pump. And also, there's a very well-tuned engine. The same engine, albeit, but now producing 500 horsepower. Finally, and most important in most racing cars, are the sponsors' colour schemes and logos. Here is the car that I won that race back in May with Lawrence Bristow, and in this case it's a Canadian brewer with a very important message. Inside, all the trim is stripped out, the massive rollover cage for safety, the piping laid inside for protection, for the driver, the gear lever, beside it, the brake balance adjuster, and also an anti-roll bar adjustment which helps the handling whilst driving. The racing seat holding the driver firmly in place and straight ahead of the steering wheel. Now what else do we need? Ah, that's better. Now, let's see what it's like.
the main thing about Group A is that it's a compromise formula. Unlike single seaters or Group C, it's not a car that's designed for racing alone. It's a compromise. It's a road car made into a racing car. With these engines race tuned, you've got 500 horsepower to hold on the road, but the regulations limit the amount of tyres you're allowed to have, the tyre width. So getting 500 horsepower down onto the road in what's basically a saloon car causes quite a few interesting situations. The suspension is it's relatively soft. You can't get the torsional rigidity that a racing car provides because the body shell is full of holes. So you have to make do as best you can. Suspension, of course, still very stiff compared with the road car, but there's an awful lot of wheel waving and steering wheel work to be done in a Group A car. Braking is a much longer braking area as well as a racing car. So, all in all, you need a lot more road in a Group A car than perhaps you do in a Packer racer. understeer into the corners and then snapping to oversteer when the brute power of 500 horsepower is applied. <laughs> and that was applying a little bit too much too soon. Well, that's all for this week now.